First of all, Professor Chomsky, thank you so very much for coming to uh, speak to us uh, here at Brooklyn for Peace. And I uh, myself have this uh, special privilege to, um, to, uh, to talk to you, which is uh, for me, it's really uh, you know, like a, a lifetime opportunity. So I cannot even describe uh, how grateful I am. So thank you very much. Pleasure for me. Um, um, I've, uh, if you remember, we met um, when I was at um, Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, and perhaps that was the uh, first time, if not the only time, you came to speak to the department students directly. Um, yeah, and uh, that was also re really a great uh, privilege for me and my fellow students. Uh, I remember that at that time, uh, back in 2000, Three years before the Iraq war started, you actually talked about Judith Miller and New York Times and things like that. And uh, um, uh, looking back, it was uh, like a prophecy that you uh, uh, picked uh, out some important names out of that very important newspaper and, and the way they do their journalism. Now, having been a journalism student myself, uh, and uh, uh, working with uh, the media and knowing a little bit more about how corporate media really works. Uh, sometimes I wonder, is there any way we can do something so that corporate media is not really so overly powerful and not able to brainwash uh, the American people and uh, the world people so easily? Is there anything that we can do? Uh, one way is by honest, dedicated participation. Actually, there are plenty of journalists who do courageous, honorable work. Uh, I may not like their, the framework in which they present it, but it's, uh, you can learn a lot from it. Like, I read the New York Times first thing every morning. Uh, and there are journalists who uh, do understand the limits and try to uh, press them, break through them. Uh, introduce material that uh, doesn't conform to uh, standard doctrine. Uh, they'll run into constraints, but it can be done. Another possibility is uh, developing alternative media, uh, which uh, uh, can uh, uh, influence the major media simply by their critical exposure of things that are happening. So an organization like FAIR, for example, Fairness and Accuracy in Media, which does a, a very sharp and, and intelligent critical analysis of the media, I presume has an influence. They'll never admit it, but I'm sure they read it and uh, are influenced by it. Uh, another approach is just to change the nature of the country. Uh, popular opinion can have an impact on the media. Uh, I might mention that although a lot of my work is uh, on the media is critical. A good part of it is defense of the media. And it's interesting that that can't be noticed. So for example, if you take the book Manufacturing Consent, Edward Herman and I wrote the book, uh, it's uh, considered a harsh attack on the media, condemned as a conspiracy theory, so on. If you actually read the book, which almost nobody does, about a third of it is defense of the media against a severe attack by liberal organizations. That's about uh, the Free Freedom House that published a two-volume study, extensive two-volume study, uh, condemning the mainstream media for essentially losing the war in Vietnam. Uh, it's about the Tet Offensive. It's called Big Story, two big volumes. And it's a sharp attack on the media. I may be one of the few people who actually read the two volumes. If you read them, it's interesting. The first volume is denunciation of the media. The second volume is documentation to try to back it up. If you look at the documentation, it refutes the conclusions in the first part. And what it actually shows is that the journalists performed professionally, honestly, courageously, described what was happening, but within a framework 
of subordination to U.S. power and doctrine. So uh, they, they described what was happening, but they said, well, it's, un, it's an unfortunate uh, effect of our, the failure of our uh, effort to defend South Vietnam. Uh, the U.S. was defending South Vietnam about the way uh, the Russians were defending Afghanistan. But the doctrine is so strong that it cannot be questioned. So that's the framework. Our noble defense of South Vietnam is not working. But within that framework, there's honest, courageous work. Uh, the journalists didn't like that. They'd much rather be accused of being uh, traitors who are uh, courageous uh, tribunes of the people who are undermining uh, power and doctrine than being described as honest professionals who are conforming to doctrine unconsciously. That's not the image they like, so they don't like this picture. But that's pretty common. Okay. Um, well, one of the questions that always um, comes to my mind is how to uh, bridge the gap between the various um, segments of the ordinary working class people. Uh, for example, um, um, I've worked with the immigrant rights movement after 9-11 uh, when um, so many hate crimes were happening uh, throughout the city and, as a matter of fact, throughout the country. And um, myself being a first-generation immigrant from Calcutta, uh, uh, having come from a poor background, I've actually seen how poor immigrants live in uh, New York City and in various parts of the United States. Uh, and so they are struggling and many of them do not have papers, they are undocumented immigrants. And then for the past six or seven years, I've been working uh, with one of the biggest uh, labor unions in, in New York uh, City, um, the Electrical Workers Union, and I've been working as the labor educator, um, um, teaching them some classes on economics and politics and media and whatnot. Now, uh, there is such a huge gap when it comes to understanding the solidarity that there could be. Instead of finding solidarity for each other, there is so much animosity and acrimony and even hatred about poor immigrants, undocumented immigrants. Um, how do you bridge the gap? It's an old part of American history. It goes back uh, 150 years. Uh, the immigrants who came were treated very badly. Uh, you go back to the late 19th century. <coughs> uh, Irish immigrants were treated practically like uh, African Americans. Uh, like in Boston, where a huge Irish immigration, uh, you could find signs saying on the restaurants, uh, no dogs are Irish. Uh, the, uh <coughs> Some of the stories are pretty awful. Like uh, American uh, the gynecological, if I could have a glass of water maybe, the uh, modern gynecology was developed at places like Harvard Medical School by experimentation with live subjects, and mostly black, also Irish, who were treated not very differently. Uh, the uh, immigrants from Eastern and Southeastern Europe uh, were called uh, mostly Huns and bitterly condemned. Uh, this continues. What changed it was worker struggles. So if you get to the great strikes of the 1890s, you know, Homestead, things like that, that overcame the divisions in the working class between the already established immigrants and the new ones who they feared and hated. The same thing happened with the black-white relations. Much of the hostility was overcome by joint struggle. Happened again in the 1930s. The uh, CIO organizing uh, brought together uh, groups that had had uh, lots of uh, hostility, racism, and antagonism. And that uh, runs right through the history. Uh, you can understand the hatred and antagonism. Uh, we made it, and they're threatening us by working more cheaply than we do, or most of it's myth, but myth is easy to establish. And it can be overcome by common struggle and by education. One of the real serious consequences of the decline of the labor movement in the last 
half century is the decline in worker education. Uh, you go back to the 19th century, uh, working people, they were very poor, and most of them didn't go to school, but they were often very well educated, uh, like the so-called factory girls, the young women from the farms who went into the textile mills in, uh, uh, in, around eastern Massachusetts and the uh, Irish um, you know, artisans who were coming to the mills. Uh, they read modern literature, what was then modern literature, what we regard as classics. Uh, they were politically very astute. You look at their journals, they had their own, liter they had their own journals, very sophisticated. Uh, an Irish blacksmith, let's say in Boston, if he had enough money, would uh, hire a boy to read to him while he was working. And that didn't mean reading comic books. That meant reading what we now regard as classics. Uh, the British working class, it was the same. There's a wonderful study of reading habits of the British working class by Jonathan Rhodes. Uh, he concludes they were better educated than the aristocracy. And I can remember, I'm old enough to remember the 1930s. My, my family were mostly uh, first-generation immigrants, Jewish immigrants, uh, unemployed, mostly unemployed, working class. Very, uh, many of them didn't, barely went to school, uh, but the discussions were uh, uh, the latest concert of the Buddhist, Budapest String Quartet, uh, Shakespeare plays, uh, every branch of psychoanalysis, uh, every political movement you can think of. Uh, that was working class culture. And there was working class education. Uh, many leading intellectuals, uh, most of them incidentally associated with the Communist Party, you're not allowed to say that, but it's true, uh, were devoting time and energy, well-known scientists, to workers' education. Um, a lot of that has just seriously declined uh, and disappeared, and working-class culture is now nothing like uh, what it had been in the past. And all of that matters. I mean, it's not just knowing the facts about contemporary society, uh, being part of the uh, the the general intellectual culture, the treasures of the intellectual culture of the past, that makes a big difference. And there's absolutely no reason why that can't be part of ordinary working class uh, uh, culture and society. It has been in the past, it can be now. That could make a major difference. Also in understanding questions of, say, racism. For example, knowing the history would be very illuminating. The history is very striking. It keeps recapitulating over and over. Uh, for example, we might remember that uh, the first, aside from Orientals, there was always Oriental exclusion laws, but in immigration laws, the first real racist immigration law was 1924, and it was designed to keep out Jews and Italians. That was 1924. They were the ones who were denounced and attacked. Well, they finally made it into the society, now uh, others are being subjected to that. Uh, Professor Chomsky, you've um, just mentioned about the importance of history, and uh, my own personal feeling and experience, having lived in uh, two countries for approximately half of my life each, uh, first half in India uh, and second half in the United States, um, in both countries, there is uh, obviously a, a, a huge um, ignorance, particularly uh, when it comes to the younger generation. Uh, otherwise, they're very smart people. I'm not even talking about the um, economic underclass right now. I'm talking about the uh, middle class, educated young men and women. Um, unfortunately, they have no sense of history in either country. Um, and uh, that, as in my opinion, that has really contributed to um, their lack of understanding of politics and economics and um, people struggle. Um, how do you change that scenario? Well, partly that's the educational system, uh, which is designed to prevent uh, understanding of the real world. Uh, that's increasingly true in the last uh, 
10 or 15 years with the drive towards uh, a, what's called accountability, imposing what amounts to corporate values on the school system. So a training to test. We all know from our own experiences that you can take a course that you're not interested in and study for an exam and get a good grade and a week later you forgot what the course was about. You learn when you have motivation, when you're engaged, when you're searching yourself and so on. That's what good teaching is. A teaching to test kills that. Whatever the motive is of the people who are instituting it, the consequences are to undermine understanding and serious education and to turn people into passive uh, obedient automata. Uh, but even the content of the school curriculums is is designed in such a way that children cannot get a real grasp of what the history is. So for example, what you and I were just talking about, labor history, uh, immigrant history, you have to look really hard to find any of that discussed in uh, American schools, uh, even in places like, say, uh, uh, Pittsburgh, where a lot of it was happening. It's just wiped out. And it's wiped out because uh, it's a business-run society. Uh, schools, like everything else, are largely run by the business community, and this is not what they want people to know. Um, I could, uh, my own, I happen to live in a, a suburb with, uh, which is considered, you know, progressive uh, uh, academics, professionals, and so on. Good school system. And I remember when my one of my daughters was in school, 1969, uh, and I happened to be she was 10 years old, fourth grade. I was looking through one of her textbooks on uh, colonial New England. Uh, the design of the book was that the uh, there was a protagonist, you know, Robert, a boy their age, who was being shown the wonders of colonial New England by an older man. That was the general structure. And I was curious to see what they would do about the big massacres. So I looked up the Pequot massacre, one of the worst massacres. And what happened is that the colonists waited until the uh, men had left the village to go hunting or something. Then they went in and slaughtered all the women and children and elderly people, and then everyone fled and it was considered a great victory. So I wanted to see how it was what, how it was described. That's how it was described, but as a triumph. And in fact, uh, the protagonist, Robert, afterwards says uh, something like, I wish I were a man and had been there, so I could have done it too. Uh, my wife, was, I showed it to her, she was kind of appalled naturally, and she went to talk to the teacher. The teacher didn't understand what she was talking about. Couldn't, and she said, look, look, you know, it's describing what happened, you know. That's the educational system. Um, there are, after all, two huge crimes that are the basis of American society. The one is the extermination of the indigenous population, the other is slavery. Are they, I mean, there's like a mention of them. But are they taught? Are there consequences taught? Uh, the consequences are very evident right today uh, in, in, in the African American and the remnants of the uh, Native American communities. Is that presented as, uh, and in fact it's the basis of the growth and development of American society. Is that presented? Uh, take say the uh, Imperial Wars. Uh, some of the greatest American writers like Mark Twain uh, bitterly condemned the imperial wars. The Philippine War, for example, Twain was a bitter opponent of it. His essays, his anti-imperialist essays, were virtually suppressed for almost 100 years, uh, 90 years. And even now, they're more or less unknown. But these are just not part of the things that we're taught. Our own history is not taught. And that's understandable. That those who are in elite positions, in decision-making positions, uh, have no interest in having that taught. It goes all the way to the universities. I mean, there's exceptions, of course, but it's, uh, and there have been changes. So for example, take, say, Howard Zinn's uh, People's History. When that first came out, it was very harshly attacked by the historians. It, uh, 
it wasn't permitted into schools. Uh, by now, kids are reading it in school. It's, uh, and other things have come along. It can be changed, but it's work. And the workers' education uh, programs, they can be revived and would be very valuable for working class people and for dealing with the human problems of the kind that you describe. And so to get back to your first point, the hostility between the established working class and the immigrants would be extremely valuable for the participants in that conflict to know what 150 years of history has been and how it's been overcome repeatedly. Okay. Um, I have one more question. Given that uh, in both um, India and the United States, the two countries I know well, um, in both countries we've recently seen a huge um, right-wing landslide victories. Uh, and um, uh, on one hand, uh, being on the so-called progressive side, it's uh, very disturbing and troubling to people like us. But on the other hand, isn't it true that over time, a left, a quote unquote left and quote unquote liberal really have lost touch with the day-to-day -day struggles of the ordinary people and they have uh, kind of practiced their elitist politics and that has actually worked more to their detriment um, and if that is the case, I uh, sometimes think, and I've actually written about it, uh, that um, it's time that we come out of this uh, traditional left-right box and liberal conservative box, and because at the end of the day, the struggle is really between the 1% and the 99%. Is there any way we can find commonalities across the 99% and bring them together uh, as long as they're sane and moderate people and build solidarity? Well, um, there are similar, there's differences between the two countries, but yes, these developments are taking place. The Congress Party has, you know, it's hard to see why poor and working people could dedicate themselves to it, given its record. You take the Democratic Party here, it uh, long ago abandoned the white working class, doesn't even pretend. Uh, there's actually a recent uh, memoir that came out by Al Fromm, important man in American history. He's uh, the person who takes credit, probably, with some justification for moving the Democratic Party to the right, uh, to becoming what used to be called moderate Republicans, uh, the kind of Clinton Democrats, New Democrats. He thinks that's wonderful. They essentially abandoned the uh, economic issues that are critically significant for most of the population. Uh, we've lived through a generation of uh, neoliberal attack on the population in which, uh, for say for working people, uh, they're kind of back where they were in 1969. That's serious. If the Democratic Party says, well, we don't care about you, you know, you're just uh, do something else, why should they vote Democratic? Uh, if uh, the latest vote, the last election last week, uh, was the lowest turnout since I think around 1940, the middle of the war, when people didn't vote. Why? Well, for one reason, because whether you know, people understand what is shown in academic political science, uh, that their voices just don't matter. The opinions of maybe 70% of the population, lowest 70% on the income scale, are simply disregarded. And as you move up the scale, there's a little bit more influence. When you get to the very top fraction of 1% of the population, they basically make policy. Uh, people don't have to read uh, academic political science to know that. They know it in their lives. So why bother? Uh, as the I mean, what's happened over the past roughly 40 years is that both parties have shifted to the right. Uh, the Democrats are essentially what used to be called moderate Republicans. The Republicans are just off the spectrum. They're not a parliamentary party anymore. And that's actually recognized by uh, leading conservative analysts, the most, one of the most respected of them, uh, Norman Ornstein, American Enterprise Institute, uh, describes the Republican Party today as a radical insurgency that has abandoned parliamentary par politics. Actually, you can see it in the last, uh, ever since the Obama election. 
and Mitch McConnell and others made it very explicit right off that they have only one policy, ruin the country as much as possible, hope that people will blame it on the Democrats, and then maybe we can get power back again and we can uh, follow our program of dedicating ourselves with utter servility to the needs of the very rich in the corporate sector. Well, now of course in order to gain votes they can't say that. So what they've done is mobilize the sectors of the population that have always been there but have never really been politically mobilized like uh, evangelical Christians, uh, uh, nativists who are afraid that uh, they are taking our country away from us, uh, uh, white racists, and, you know, uh, uh, gun people who are so terrified that they have to carry their guns into church because maybe somebody will come after them. You know, these sectors of the population are there and that's now the base of the Republican Party. It was very striking to watch the primaries, the electoral primaries. And one after another person came out from the base, each one crazier than the last. You know, Backman, Cain, you know, Santorum, all raving lunatics. The Republican establishment was frightened and they poured money in to try to destroy them. And they managed to knock them down and get one of their own men in, Romney, you know, kind of establishment Republican, but only by undermining the base. And they're facing it again right now. now the base that they've organized and had to organize because their, their commitments are so far to the right uh, has, is now, they can't, they're having a hard time keeping it under control. I mean, I don't want to draw analogies too closely, but it has some similarity to what happened in Germany in the 1930s. I'm not, I'm not the only one to point this out. Incidentally, it's leading German historians have pointed it out, and it's frightening. Well, um, we have uh, so much to talk about, but we have so little time, so we probably have to, unfortunately, come to a close. I just have one final 30-second question. What's after Noam Chomsky? What after? is Who is going to carry the Noam Chomsky torch forward? You. And plenty of other people. There's lots of people. They should be more prominent, better known, but they're doing really good work. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for your time. Yep.